Good evening, and welcome to Olathe's Public Schools Student Health Seminar. I'm Sharon Morris, Director of Health Services, and I'll be moderating this event this evening. Our topic is vaping information for parents. Vape use among adolescents has increased at a, such an alarming rate that it has been declared an epidemic at both state and national levels. According to 2018 numbers from the CDC, some 3.6 million students in middle school and high school vape. National surveys of youth indicate that the numbers of secondary students who uh, respond that they have vaped nicotine in the past month have roughly doubled since 2017. Our district has been providing education for the past year. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you with current information from a variety of experts on this topic that will prepare you to discuss this with your children. Each panelist will have about 10 to 15 minutes to speak and that will be followed by a question and answer session. Our panelists are Kevin Kufel, licensed clinical professional counselor and licensed clinical addiction counselor. He's the program manager at the Adolescent Center for Treatment. Jamie Schmidt from Olathe Police Department is a school resource officer in Olathe. Don Heimer is the assistant district attorney for Johnson County. And Tim Brady is the director of athletic and activities of the Olathe Public Schools and works closely with safe and drug free schools. Kevin, would you like to begin? Sure. All right, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight and uh, uh, spending some time to educate yourself a little bit more on. Vaping and what we're seeing uh, both in the school setting but also just in our home community. As you've heard, the, the, the vaping epidemic and the impact it's having on our, on our adolescents, on our youth, um, is starting to get to a point, the level where it's um, an alarming rate where we're concerned about what to do next and how do we um, best educate not only parents but also the adolescents. Even this week, uh, yesterday, I was at Pioneer Trail Middle School. I'm not sure if you have um, students or um, children that attend that school at Pioneer Trail Middle School, presenting both of their 7th and 8th grade students. Just kind of talk about uh, what we're seeing, what we know about uh, vaping and the impact it has on them, um, not only on their, their, potentially on their lungs and their body, but also their brains and their cognitive and executive functioning. So I think this is something that, um, as a parent, is, is valuable information and, and information you can take home with you, uh, just to be better educated and to allow yourself to feel more informed. I do have a few slides uh, prepared, so this is my information, and you're always welcome to shoot me a call. My direct line is 913-715-7639, and uh, I do work at the Adolescent Center for Treatment. And if you're not familiar with the ACT, we're the only residential drug and alcohol treatment facility in the state of Kansas. So I've got youth uh, from as far away as Dodge City, Kansas, that are currently receiving services at um, our residential program. So my knowledge, although I do a lot of research on the topic, a lot of my knowledge comes firsthand from the actual kids, uh, telling you about what they're using, uh, anywhere from vaping, also to cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, marijuana, different oils and different concentrates, and some of the different pills that they're using out there too. So um, my knowledge base does not stop just with vaping. So if you have additional substance use questions, I'd be happy to assist you with those as well. And. Uh, Something I like to take a closer look at, and I'm trying to get creative because when I meet with kids, they don't just want to hear a bunch of facts, so I'm trying to make some correlations for them. And if you think back, when I was uh, in high school, the internet was coming out. They were talking about being the information superhighway, the World Wide Web, and that was talking about how you're going to have all this information at your fingertips. And when that came out, we were saying, now there's some pretty basic rules you need to understand about being on the internet. One of those rules is, don't ever meet somebody that you meet online. Because you don't know who they are, you don't know where they're coming from, you don't know much about them. And certainly, don't give them any of your personal information. So you don't meet up with them, you don't give them your information. Those are some pretty standard safety precautions for getting on the World Wide Web. And then I also you know, kind of take into consideration some of those universal uh, safety tips of not to be from strangers, or not um, accepting something from somebody that you don't know, and so on, getting in the car with somebody like that. So those are some of the, those uh, precautionary safety tips that we provided to everybody. Is, the internet was coming out, people were starting to use it, and then moving forward with life. Now we fast forward to 2019, and on most of our phones right now, we have the app for Uber or Lyft. And what do we do? We log on to this app, we find somebody who's nearby us, 
We tell them where we are, they come and they pick us up, maybe they pick us up from home, we get into their car, we pay them, they transport us to the airport, they know that they just dropped us, dropped us off at the airport from our home, they now know that we're flying away to another state, and we're, gonna, and we're giving them like all access to our lives. So now they can drive back to our house, they can rob our house, do what they want to do to us. But we've put all caution in the wind. We're giving people money, we're getting in their cars, we don't know them, and we're probably telling them a whole lot more about our lives than we probably should be when we're in their car. So there's this mentality that because it's new, it's, it's inventive, it's, it's technologically advanced, that it's a safe alternative to the ways that we were living our lives. So now we fast forward to e-cigarettes. And back in the day, many people remember the Marlboro Man, and part of what the Marlboro Man talked about was coming to where the flavor is. And we've gone through several Marlboro men because many of them have died or passed away due to emphysema and cancer. A lot of research has gone into getting people off of cigarettes. Billions of dollars have been spent on campaigns, uh, research, education, to tell people that cigarettes will cause you to get cancer, can cause birth defects in babies, is harmful for your health, and you should stop smoking cigarettes. We're now dealing with a generation of kids who know the dangers of smoking. They don't want to smoke. So even when I'm doing the assessment on a kid, I ask them, do you smoke? The answer is no. And then I say, do you vape? Well, yeah, I vape, but I don't smoke. And so we almost like get real technical when we're talking with kids about their use. So now we're, um, so when there was the Marlboro Man, then they started getting creative. They started using cartoon animals in the camel. And so they started using camel cigarettes and using their uh, advertising slogans with this, with this cartoon animal. And if you look down there at the very bottom, we're down here. Those are fake cigarettes. Those are candy cigarettes. And so when I was a kid, I'd go to the grocery store, I'd go to the convenience store, gas station, and my grandfather would buy me a pack of um, caramel smokes. And they had a little bit of powder on them. You could puff on them, create like a little powder smoke. And then I'd chew the gum. I carried the pack in my sleeve, or I carried it in my back pocket. I thought that was pretty cool. So what's happened was we spent all this time, all this energy, all these dollars on, uh, on tobacco prevention and educating people on the harmful effects. So what did they have to do? They had to get kind of creative, they had to get inventive. So they left the analogical stage of smoking, and we've now entered into the digital age of smoking with vaping. And as we look at that target population, it's the youth. Because if you look at an industry, they're not really concerned with grasping the attention of a 35-year-old uh, married mother of three kids. They're looking for that kid, because then they're getting their hands on that lifelong user. So when we talk about who they are really targeting with their, uh, with their vaping campaigns, it is for adolescents. You look at the flavors, we're talking um, candy, pop, or cotton candy, we're talking Jolly Ranch, we're talking Skittles, we're talking mango fruit and, and vanilla creme brulee. All these beautiful, wonderful flavors that are attracting the kids. Now recently, Juul was uh, FDA regulated, or FDA went into their uh, factories and pulled up all their documentation in fact, a lot of information about how they were quote unquote advertising the kids. And what they learned was they were using the influencers. And if you, uh, they would research and find someone who had an Instagram account or some type of uh, online social media, and then find out how many, what was the target population of that individual? Did they have um, youth that were from the ages of 13 to 18? And how many followers did they have? And then they would pay that influencer to use their device on their vlogs. And that person would just talk about, how awesome the taste of creme brulee jewel was, and they should try it. And so they're paying this influencer to do all their advertising for them. <clears throat> so as you look at the flavors here, um, this is just one example of different types of flavors. We've got Nutterfinger, Peppermint Patty, Rue Dip, Raspberry, and Reese's Dream. Now Reese's Dream is a dollop of rich peanut butter enveloped in chocolate. The sounds of these, the sweet vanilla icing with subtle undertones of caramel and custard, sweet raspberries with blue raspberries and a hint of black cherry, and dark chocolate with Peppermint Center. It sounds very good. It sounds very appealing. This is where the target hits. So, the evolution of e-cigarette. Generation 1 was what was called this carnivite from here. It looked like a fake cigarette. It was a uh, container of nicotine that was pre-identified so it had a certain level of nicotine in it. Once you smoked it, it was gone. You disposed of it and you went on to a different one. Then came Generation 2 with this clear miser. This was called the tanking system. And this is where you actually poured your e-juice into that tanking system. It has a cotton wicking with a um, heating coil mechanism. And you can change the flavors, you can change the amount of nicotine you're using. And that was the clear miser. 
Then came Generation 3, which is right here in this atomizer. This is called a dripping technique. And you actually drip the product on top of the cotton and the, oil, uh, the heat, heating coils. And this is what was creating those large plumes of smoke. People were using these for vape competitions and cloud chasing competitions. And so the atomizer became pretty popular in the vaping industry. Now we fast forward to um, some different types of vaping devices. These right here in the middle are called box mods. And these are actually important because they have almost like a computer mechanism in there where a user can control the amount of ohms they're using, the heat, and it also can be uh, Bluetooth compatible with their cell phone. This allows them to kind of start monitoring the amount of intake that they're having throughout the day and uh, how often they're using. And then became the Jewel. And the Jewel was really popular with obviously with adolescents because of its um, sleek design looking like a flash drive device that people were um, really privy to what they look like. And now we're looking at the Soar and Drop, which uh, there's also the Soar and Air. And I did bring some devices with me tonight if you want to take a look at those and just kind of see what they look like, put your hands on them, uh, and actually see how small and compact they are. Now, Jewel hit the market pretty hard. And it's been dominating the, the uh, adolescent market. So what really it was in the beginning was a safe alternative to smokers. And that's what this device was originally designed for, in theory, was a smoking device for adults. And it is the ability to allow them to stop smoking combustible cigarettes and allow them to use this device that was a nicotine only. Now, in theory, one could argue that if you're using a tobacco product, such as a combustible cigarette, the amount of carcinogens and tar that go into your system is very harmful. These are nicotine only devices, so they don't have the tobacco in them. So you could argue that they are a healthier alternative. Oftentimes, people refer to it as a safer alternative, but safer does not always equal safe. And so when we look at the, the effects of Juul on the market, uh, it saturated the adolescents. What you'll see here is that 75% of the UK cigarette market is uh, with the Juul device, and 41% of the US market is with the Juul device. So why is the Juul so appealing? So they use what's called nicotine salts, or nic salts. They also use a high dosage of benzoic acid. And those two components are very important because um, when you look at the benzoic acid of other devices, they use about 2 milligrams per milliliter. Juul uses 44 milligrams per milliliter. And when you say, well, why is that so important? You look at an adolescent who may have never used e-cigarettes before or maybe never even smoked traditional cigarettes. When they use this device, the benzoic acid along with the nick salts lowers the pH level and creates a less harsh feeling on their lungs, so it doesn't hurt. So when they're using this device, a first-time user who's never used it before, takes a hit off this jewel and then exhales, and they said, well, that didn't even hurt. So then they were able to develop a device that will pull this adolescent in more frequently, and then they continue using this product. It's also found that uh, jewel devices have about anywhere from 5 to 8% nicotine. The European market only allows about 2.5% nicotine, so it's already double that's what's being used in Europe. So, uh, one pod of uh, e oh, I'm sorry, with Juul devices is equivalent to about a pack of cigarettes. You know, when I'm meeting with kids and doing assessments with them, oftentimes they say that they're using about one to two pods. One to two pods sounds a lot better than 20 to 40 cigarettes. Um, so they're not really making that conversion rate um, in their mind because they're using a one to two pod um, usage. When we talk about vaping, there's often this misconception that um, it's a vapor, that it's water. And when I would talk with kids really in the beginning, I'd say, well, what's in your vape? They're like, well, water and nicotine, um, and maybe some like propylene glycol. Now, propylene glycol and glycerin are the two main additives that are added to all these that create that plume of smoke. But when you look at a nicotine device, delivery device, and the different types of chemicals that go on there, this is a laundry list that would potentially be in many of those. Those that are in red are known to be carcinogenic to humans or cancer-causing agents. If you look through here and you know your periodic table of elements, uh, you'll find a lot of those are found in here. But uh, arsenic's one of them, uh, naphthalene, formaldehyde. Many of these products are used um, in everyday usage, so as the propylene glycol is used in makeups and lotions, but it was never intended to be absorbed into your lungs, a very vascular system. What we don't know right now is what are those long-term effects, but we are starting to see more and more about the um, health risks or the health effects of people that are using these out in the community, uh, whether it's like a pulmonary uh, lung disease or acute uh, respiratory problems. What they're finding with many of these illnesses is that people are smoking e-cigarettes, they're getting lung or fluid in their lungs, and it decreases the amount of oxygen in their brain. So we are getting a lot of people in the ER um, and in coma patients as well. What we have seen with those who are dying from these products we're seeing in the news, many of them have high potencies or high rates of vitamin E. And 
uh, many of them are likely black market products that are bought online or bought off the streets from a dealer or from a friend, and they're not regulated, so we don't really know what's in them. As a whole, the e-cigarette market is not regulated by the FDA. Uh, I believe the government has identified that by 2026, all products need to be regulated. However, they've also fast-forwarded that through some of the recent news, but I believe 2022. Uh, is when they'll start regulating these products. So when I talk with kids and we're talking about all these products that are in there, all these chemicals, and they ask, well, why, is it, why don't they tell you what's in there? Because they don't have to. It's not regulated by the FDA. They don't have to, from what I understand, they don't have to list all these items that are there. So the kids don't know about all this stuff. However, they are putting this stuff in their systems. All these fine metal particles that are being emitted from these products um, are then either going into the air or into their lungs. So is big tobacco going away? The answer to that is no. Um, Altria, which is um, the owner of Philip Morris, now owns 35% of the Jewel company. I believe they did about 18 or 12.8 billion dollars is what they invested in the Jewel. And that was after um, Altria started to come out with this Mark 10 Elite product. It was basically like a Jewel device that they didn't sell. So they decided to buy in the Jewel. So they're now 35% owners. And then Altria is also investing in a new company. It's a Kronos company in um, Canada. And they are 45, yeah, 45% 45 owners of that company, and they uh, contribute about almost $2 billion to them. They are going to be a marijuana industry that is now going to start infusing sports drinks, teas, margaritas, uh, energy drinks with cannabis. So big tobacco is not burning by any means. By the invention of the e-cigarette, they're actually buying into it, and they're starting to promote themselves into the, uh, into the marijuana industry. So we talked about devices, I know the officer here tonight is going to be talking about some of these other devices. Uh, we've got the, uh, the hoodie that has the drawstring that's a, a tube for vaping from. You have a backpack there at the bottom left corner that's designed specifically for vaping. There's a tube on the left hand side of that strap as well. You've got lipstick that looks like a, uh, or it's a vapor that looks like a lipstick. Over here you've got your Apple device that pops out and it's also a vaporizer. And you've got your ink pens up top and you've got phone cases. Uh, if you have a key fob that maybe you have a key that kind of you push the button and your key kind of flips out, they've got key fobs that look like vaping devices as well. So there's a company out there, or there are companies out there, that specifically divide, design these products to be discreet so that they're not easily detectable. Um, that's really kind of marketing to the adolescent who's trying to stay out of trouble because an adult user of a vape device isn't worried about getting caught by mom and dad or being um, caught at school with this product. So they're trying to stay ahead of the game and trying to meet uh, the demand of the youth that are out there. So, um, a couple of things. This is kind of jumping into the marijuana industry here, but vaping, we're starting to find more and more of the schools that when the vaping devices are apprehended by um, the SROs, that they're also um, THC oil pens. And many of you have probably heard of 420. Uh, when people say 420, they're gonna, um, uh, that's when they're going to smoke marijuana. This is the new number. This is 710. And 710, when flipped upside down, spells oil. And so at 7.10 p.m., 7.10 a.m., or on July 10th, um, those are all times where you start using cannabis oil. So it's kind of a knockoff on the 420. This is now for cannabis oils. And these are just high potency, high concentrates of marijuana uh, that individuals are purchasing and are used much like an oil pen. Uh, and so these are some examples. So if you look right here at the Stizzy brand, it looks a lot like the Jewel device. It looks like a flash drive device. Um, up here is the key fob oil pen. Um, right here is just a small, looks like a battery. And then down here is just a smaller um, oil pen device by, um, I think it's called like heavy hitters or something like that. But, um, so now the marijuana industry is capitalizing on the vaping industry because that's where their market is going. So when you talk about uh, individuals who are vaping, they now want to vape their um, marijuana as opposed to smoking from a traditional flower bud, uh, bong, or another rig like that. So. Uh, that's when we're starting to see more and more youth being suspended from school because they have the possession of the THC oil pens. So that's a quick little snapshot on banking, and uh, I'll be able to answer some questions for you as well. Yeah. Wow, I don't know if I can follow that up. That's amazing. <laughs> I think I learned some more than anything. So I'm just a school resource officer. I don't have just, I'm just, I'm just a lonely school resource officer. I'm on the bottom. Um, I don't have any, you know, major degrees or anything like that. I just got my little BS. And that's it. Um, I've been an officer for 20 years, obviously. 
talking to kids, I've been in the schools for the last five years as an SRO, seeing the trend of the um, babies coming up. I mean, when I went to school years and years ago, it was, you kind of had your groups. You kind of, you could, you could tell by looking at a group of kids, like, okay, these are, these are the ones that are doing the marijuana or other things. Here were your kiddos that would come to school who were drinking, you kind of knew them, you knew the smokers were over here, um, and you could kind of see that. The, the vaping industry has definitely like taken over all of those age groups, all of those groups of kids. You've got, um, I've got band kids that are, are smoking vapes um, at band conventions or band performances and getting in trouble. I've got theater kids that are getting in trouble. I've got athletes that, you know, in my day, if you were an athlete, you didn't smoke because that would hinder your performance on the field. We have multiple student athletes that are getting in trouble for vaping devices. So it kind of has gone the full spectrum. You've got even your, your what, I, what we used to call the smart kids who they knew better and they're vaping. Um, it's so much easier now, I think. We have multiple age groups. I've seen it starting in sixth grade. One of my junior highs when I, uh, last year, the year before, we had a sixth grader. I was talking to another school resource officer who had a fourth grader who had some baby pins. So, I mean, I think of the, the age of my kids, I have a sixth grader and how immature he is, and then if somebody was to give him one of those, I know he would probably go right along with it. The amount of crime that we're having has really gone up along with these vaping devices. You know, the kids know that if I get caught with a vape device, it's not that big of a deal. I get a ticket, the officer's going to write me a ticket, I'm going to go to court, I'm going to pay a fine, they're going to take my device, I'm not going to get it back, so I'm going to have to buy another one, which, not that big of a deal. There's enough of a market out there, there's enough kids selling these things to other kids or 18-year-olds that are you know, older siblings of kids that are buying them and then giving them to the younger ones to sell. So the kids know all I have to do is put out on Snapchat, hey, I need a jewel, or I need a bake device or whatever else, and they know that within a few minutes somebody is going to snap back and say, oh, meet me at this location or whatever. That's where some of our crimes have now come into. So now we've got kids that are meeting up with other kids that they don't know, getting into vehicles with people that they don't know, and our crime rate is going up. So we've got kids that are robbing other kids because they know they're going to show up to a specific location with money in hand to buy a product, and one, they're not going to have that product, and they're just going to take the money from that kid and possibly other things. So, and they know a lot of the kids aren't going to report it because what am I going to do? Am I going to go home and tell mom and dad that hey, I was going, I was out to buy a vape pen and somebody stole my money? You know, not not likely. Um, we had had other cases where they have told parents because other things have come up. Um, so, but now we've got the pictures that I have up here are just different devices. Um, some of them I pulled off the internet or just pictures. That's kind of it kind of they scroll through. I think every so often it'll change. Some of the devices there's pictures of specific devices that we have taken off of students here in Olathe. We have taken uh, multiple devices off of students that have um, THC in them. So the kids are buying these pre-made products that already have the marijuana in them, so they don't have to worry about it in all the packages. And I don't know if it's already scrolled through or not, but you can see when it comes up. Yep, I think it has. But there are boxes, and then on the back of the boxes, it'll tell you that it's like 89% THC is inside of these. So they're already prepackaged, and the kids are having these and they're buying them and using them in school. Uh, multiple kids, um, they see nothing wrong with that. They don't think that there's anything wrong with baby. When you talk to them, they're like, Officer Schmidt, everybody does it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, they, they do it during school. They do it in the bathrooms. And if they're getting, they're getting seen here, seen here. I don't think that we have less of a nicotine problem or less of a vape problem than we did a year ago. I think it's the same, if not higher. But our students are now getting a little smart. They know that um, I don't have to take, you know, if I take a big puff, I'm going to have a big plume. If I take a small puff, then I can blow it into my shirt or into my sleeve. 
I can do it in the girls' bathroom with the door closed. There's not going to be a big plume coming up. Uh, those kinds of things, they're easy to hand off to one another. Um, when you talk to the kids or when I, when I confiscate one, they always say, oh, I found it. You know, they always find them um, and then they start smoking them. But, so it's not getting, in my mind, it's not getting better. If, not, if anything, it's getting worse because more kids are trying. The kids are getting younger. And then thrown to the mix, now we can buy marijuana in Colorado, so now we're buying the THC, the, the, the vaping devices with the THC argument. So my expertise is just kind of what I've seen here in Olathe, and it's not going away. Um, if anything, it's just getting, getting worse. Good evening. Uh, my name is Don Heimer. I'm an assistant district attorney here in Johnson County. Um, I have been uh, in that capacity for 30, 30 years now. Uh, started, I started, uh, well, actually 29 and a half, um, almost 30 years. And obviously, this wasn't a problem when I started. Um, about two thirds or three fourths of the crimes that we see now um, that I spend a lot of time on, whether it's um, sexting or other crimes that are based on the new technologies we have. They just didn't exist when I started. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about what happens and what our office does when people do violate the law. Uh, as you've heard, it's illegal to have uh, nicotine if you are a minor. It's illegal to have these vaping devices. It's illegal to have cigarettes. It's illegal to have marijuana. It's illegal to have marijuana if you're a minor in Colorado, by the way. No place that passes or makes marijuana legal uh, for recreational purposes does so for juveniles. Um, and so all of those things are illegal for juveniles to have. In Kansas, we have a, a, a pretty minimal fine for um, violation of tobacco law, which is what the vaping is. And basically, it doesn't matter whether you have done it once, twice, ten times, it's still just a $20 or $25 fine. Um, we don't bring those cases to the district court. They are handled through our magistrate courts, which are the city courts. Uh, and they are just a ticket, just like a speeding ticket or something else uh, for juveniles uh, who, who violate that law. Uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is the ramifications that we're seeing in terms of them moving along after they start vaping. Um, it's been my experience that when kids break a boundary, it's the first boundary that's the hardest to break. And as soon as they break that boundary, they'll start breaking other boundaries. And so what happens is once they have uh, branched out in the vaping, which they know is illegal, they know their parents wouldn't want them to do it, they know it's illegal at the school, they know they'll get in trouble, it's a really short trip to uh, now the cartridges you're buying for your vape pens uh, are going to be marijuana cartridges. And where do you get those items? Uh, it's all black market, it's all illegal, and they're interacting with folks who are uh, criminals. Now, a lot of our kids will say, well, I'm buying my marijuana or my marijuana cartridges or my vapes from my buddy. Uh, he's, he's a pretty good guy, he probably wouldn't hurt me. Um, but at some point, as you go back up the food chain, you are going to interact with someone who is a drug dealer. And you're going to interact with someone who probably carries a gun. But we have experienced in Johnson County in the latter part of 2018 and thus far in 2019 is between a 30 to 40 percent increase in the number of felonies committed in our county from 2018 to 2019. A large percentage of those crimes are violent person crimes. And violent person crimes are things like aggravated robbery where you steal something from someone with a weapon involved. Um, what happens is we know that there are people who are really wanting to buy these products. So they do communicate through Snapchat, which by the way, does anyone know, uh, is there anything good about Snapchat? <laughs> no, Snapchat, does anyone know how Snapchat was created? It's created by fraternity boys back in the 90s when we very first started all this stuff and they wanted to have a way to have illicit communication and have it disappear as soon as, they, as soon as the communication was sent. That's what Snapchat does. Snapchat 
sends a message, and then it disappears. So there's no record of it anymore. Does that seem like something that legitimate people would use? Well, the answer is no. But that's what all of or many of our drug dealers use. So they send out Snapchats, and they figure out, this person says, all right, well, if you bring 100 bucks, I'll give you 20 cartridges or something like that. Well, then you've got two things going on. You've got one side thinking, I'm going to show up and they're going to have the drugs I want. And the other side's thinking, they're going to show up and have the money I want. And at some point along the line, they think, well, why would I give away the drugs? I can just take the money. Or why would I give away my money? I'll just take the drugs. And so they bring a gun. And sometimes our kids don't bring a real gun. They bring an airsoft gun. And if you've ever kids ever had airsoft guns, where do they have in the tip of them that show, show you their airsoft gun? This bright orange little circle. Well, what, what, do our, what, what do some of our geniuses do? Take a Sharpie and color it in so they can show up with a replica gun and show it to somebody and think, he's going to think I have a real gun. Now, we all probably think, is that about the dumbest thing you could do is to show up with a drug dealer with a, something that you present to be a gun and you're going to scare them when they might have a real gun? What's happened um, in late 2018, 2019, we had six or seven homicides where kids were killed under that very scenario. They showed up for a drug deal. Um, somebody decided they'd get something for free, either money or drugs. Somebody pulled something that either looked like a gun or was a gun, and then someone had a real gun, and someone got shot and killed. And this is the escalation that we have seen we used to average maybe a homicide every year or two with our juvenile population, 10 to 18 year old population. Um, in the last 18 months, we've had what would be seven to 10 years worth of homicides involving juveniles. Um, one of the reasons is we did have some legislation that passed um, that made it a little harder to hold people accountable for crimes such as dealing drugs, uh, and some of the things that we used to hold people more accountable for. Um, we're working to try to change that legislation so there can be accountability for that. Uh, it's illegal to have these drugs. It's illegal for a juvenile to have a handgun. All this stuff is illegal. Uh, but the end result is these groups are getting together and they are violent folks and somebody has a real gun and people are getting shot. So we're seeing just a lot of tragedies uh, I've met with the victims of lots of these families. Um, you know, some of them knew that, that they had folks struggling with drug use, um, others didn't. Um, and it's still just a very scary situation if you get involved with people who are carrying guns. So that's, that's one of my prim primary concerns. What we try to do is put an appropriate accountability on the early actions as much as we can. Uh, we work with, with Kevin and some of his, his folks through mental health where we try to get drug and alcohol assessments. Um, as soon as someone gets, gets caught uh, with a marijuana uh, conviction or something that we have adjudicated them for, we try to get them the services they need. Um, it's a very challenging situation right now to try to stop this trend of using these vape pens. Um, I know the kids don't think doing bait is a big deal. They absolutely don't think it is. Uh, and in some ways, it's not as big a deal as what they grow into. But what we're seeing is if you don't take that first step, you'll never take steps two and three. And we have to stop it before the first step is taken. We have to stop it before they're using the bait. So, you know, that's, that's my message to you. What we try to do is when the officers get us reports of possession of marijuana, which is a case that we will bring to the, uh, to the district court right across the street over here, and we will try to hold these kids accountable for those early entry cases where we give them the help they need so they don't grow into these other um, crimes. One of the things that we're seeing that makes it really hard is marijuana is, when someone is smoking marijuana, it's, it's fairly easy to smell, and, and leafy marijuana is very pungent, and it can, officers can smell that. That gives them the ability to search cars and, and things that they might be able to locate the marijuana. Uh, the, the cartridges, they're called, or the pods for the jewel pens, they have no real aroma at all. 
very light. I mean, it, 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 if someone is smoking marijuana, if someone is smoking marijuana in, in this room right now, we would all be able to smell it. If someone were vaping marijuana, we wouldn't. So that's one of the things that, that is making it more challenging. And so these are the type of uh, challenges that we have. Um, I think it's important uh, to, to send the message that the, the health concerns for vape is real. Um, I, I think kids who are, uh, you know, they also mentioned, you know, used to be sports was kind of a protection against smoking and protection against some of these other things. I see athletes doing all the drugs. It's not just vaping. So they, they'll they say they want to be a good athlete or they want to go to college and play this sport or that sport, but they'll also become involved in this self-destructive behavior. Um, and so, you know, they, there, are, there are tough examples out there um, of kids. I've had lawyers come into my office on kids who picked up pot charges and they're all state in this sport or that sport and they'll show me the letter from the school that they just got a scholarship that's probably worth about $100,000 a year. And they'll say, you know, if you, if you convict him of this, he's going to lose that scholarship, or she's going to lose that scholarship. And, you know, the, the problem is, you know, is that, is that kid any different than a kid who's not getting a scholarship? I mean, it, it was his or her decision to, to break the law. You have to treat all these people the same. But they're putting so much at risk. Uh, it's not just their health, it's all the opportunities they might have if they would avoid this type of behavior. And again, they always come in and they talk to me about how, well, marijuana is legal in this place or that place. It's not legal anywhere for minors. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that, um, is it's even more destructive for the, for the brain and the brain development for minors. And that's why my hope is, and I'm pretty confident, it's never going to be legal for minors anywhere. Uh, so, these are some of the things that we're seeing. I tried to jot down a few notes. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems we have is uh, adolescent decision making is very, very poor in general. I mean, we had adolescent children. Okay. So, they're pretty bad on their own, right? You put them together and it gets exponentially worse. And that's when they'll be passing around these jewel pens. That's when They'll have sleepovers. Um, one of my favorite jokes, I always ask this, how many of you have a walkout basement? Do any of you have walkout basements? Okay. I've been working to make it illegal, but I haven't had it. <laughs> the problem with that is, uh, if you're like me and you have a sleep and your, and your kids would have a sleepover, who's the only person that falls asleep? You, as a parent. And then your kids are right out the back as they get bored. They can only play that video game. This is especially true with young, with teenage boys. The number of police reports that start off with a sleepover and about two o'clock they became bored with Call of Duty or whatever they were playing and they went outside. Uh, once they get outside, what are they doing? They're rattling car handles. They don't even care, but you know, they'll rattle some car handles. If they're open, they'll go inside and steal whatever they can steal. If the garage door is open, if you're an old man like me, you fall asleep about 10 o'clock at night, your garage door is open, right? And your light's on in your garage, they go in to steal something. Sometimes they go in there, and what do a lot of people have in, the, in their garage? They have a second fridge. What's in the second fridge? Maybe beer. For teenage boys that are bored out, carousing, are they looking for beer? So they go in there and they steal the beer. What crime is that? Well, under the law in Kansas, that is a burglary because you broke into a house. Breaking does not mean you knock down the door. It means you broke the threshold of the door. And since you're like me and you're asleep, you're actually in the home, which means that's an aggravated burglary. When they made that law, garages were not attached to houses. 100 years ago, garages weren't attached to houses, right? Now garages are attached to the house. So when you enter the garage, you're entering the house. Aggravated burglary is a, if you are an adult, that's a presumption that you will go to prison for that crime. Because it's so inherently dangerous to break into somebody's house when they're there. So, the bad decision making, the, the quicker you can stop it, um, the quicker you can make sure if there's sleepovers that you're really vigilant, and whoever you're, whatever home your children are going to, make sure those parents are vigilant and you stay on top of what's happening. 
The number of police reports that I reviewed that started off with a sleepover is staggering. Uh, when I was a kid, we stopped doing sleepovers in grade school. So it was just a different world. Um, of course, TVs had antennas and we only had three stations. So it was a lot different back then. But um, I, 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 would just, I would just say, and this is what everyone that I give presentations with say, start conversations early about vaping and why it's bad, why it's unhealthy, um, and try to inoculate your children as much as you can against this type of behavior. Give them the information. Like if we go and get a flu shot, does it mean we're gonna not get the flu? No. Does it decrease the likelihood of getting the flu? Yes. And it's the same way if you start these conversations with your kid. You can't guarantee that they're not going to make some bad decisions. Children do that, adolescents do that. But if you start a conversation, I think you're increasing the chances that they'll make better decisions and they'll avoid some of these pitfalls. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pass it on uh, for now, uh, but thank you. I appreciate you being here. The best thing is that you're here, you care about this, and that you're wanting to try to do the best you can to help your children avoid uh, some of these bad decisions. Thank you, Mr. Hyman. I want to piggyback on that. I'm so glad that you're here. And on behalf of our Superintendent John Allison and our Board of Education, thanks for being part of this. We feel committed to uh, educating our parents and our students about vaping and other uh, dangers that are out there for, for kids. Uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit of what happens at school when uh, we catch a kid vaping or having vaping devices, selling it, whatever it might be. It's an immediate five-day out-of-school suspension. That sounds very punitive, but there has to be a consequence for this kind of stuff. Actually, we increased it from last year. We used it typically about three days last year, but we really want to send a message. Now, with that being said, there's a punitive consequence, but we want a restorative uh, piece as well. So we really looked uh, throughout the nation to find what else is out there that we can use to help kids who are, or who are vaping and, and, and have been caught. So we found a, a, a prevention program called Aspire. A-S-P-I-R-E, which stands for a Smoking Prevention Interactive Experience. So what happens is when a student gets suspended, we give them opportunity to go through a spire. It's a research-based, evidence-based program. It takes, it's a tutorial. It takes anywhere from three and a half hour, three and a half to five hours to complete. I've taken it myself. I got a 98%, just saying. And uh, but it's really, really good. It's bilingual, so uh, it's you can take an English or Spanish version, and it's free for our, for our students in our, our district. In fact, Olathe was the very first school district in Kansas to bring in Aspire, so we're proud to, to share that with you. When they go, kids go through the tutorial, uh, it helps them understand uh, why should they should be tobacco free, and talk about just the dangers of tobacco and nicotine use. Um, they go into some just traditional information that kids probably might know, but the reminders are good as well. But they go into e-cigs, they talk about hookahs, they talk about uh, jewels and other synthetic marijuanas that are out there. So it's very, very informative. There's animation, there's uh, videos of students speaking, and there's eight different modules that kids go through. At the end of each module, there's a set of quiz questions. Then at the very end, there's a, there's a test. And for us, you have to pass the test. And here's the good thing about passing the test. If you pass the Aspire tutorial, that is your ticket to get back to school early. So it's a huge motivation for kids and their parents for them to pass it. So as soon as they pass it, our principals receive an email from MD Anderson. This is, a, uh, this is developed uh, with, with the good folks at MD Anderson out of Houston. And that is literally their ticket back into school. And we want them to be back in school. Five days is a long time. So our response has been really good. We've had about over 200 kids that have gone through this fire. We've had it for about a, a year and a half. I, I'm pleased to say every kid that takes it passes it. Uh, because, they're, like I said, they're highly motivated. We've had kids tell us, both at the middle school and high school level, every kid should take this. So we're looking at how we can incorporate this into our curriculum and get everybody through it. I've talked to folks at MD Anderson and said, is there a quicker version that we can give? Uh, maybe, you know, an hour, hour and a half. And so they gave some ideas on how to do this. The beauty of it is you don't have to do it all in one city. You can do it, um, 
you could log off and then come back to it a little bit later. So we're going to explore that a little bit more. Uh, so anyway, if you want to look more about at this, just I'm going to give you a website here. It's just called it's Aspire Two, the number two dot mdanderson dot org, or just do a Google search of Aspire Tobacco Cessation, and it's a, a tremendous program that's been throughout uh, used throughout the country. Um, there's also a little a trailer on there so you get a little feel for what the, the kids are seeing. So anyway, we're excited about Aspire. We're going to continue using it. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Morris for our uh, Q&A. Thank you, Thank you to our panelists. And I would just like to, I'm going to start them with a question that one of them can answer, that perhaps one of them can answer. And then maybe if any of you have questions, um, you can either write them and turn them to me, or you can just raise your hand um, and ask the question, and we'll have one of our panelists answer it. Uh, I'll start it off with, how can I tell if my child is vaping? What should I look for? Well, there's not going to be any set standard, but I would say you start taking a closer look at some of those common things of, um, who am I, uh, who's my son or daughter associating with now? Have they changed their social circle of friends? Uh, are they... Uh, you know, obviously kids are locking themselves up in their room, are they becoming more isolated? Um, are they staying up later at night? Because obviously nicotine is a stimulant, it kind of keeps them wired a little bit, where they stay up later at night. Uh, but kids are also wired to stay up later. Uh, so it's not like a, uh, one clear cut definition of what they're doing, but I think I always like to take a closer look at uh, the social circle they're associating with. Uh, are they um, going through money? Are they emptying up their bank account? And uh, are they kind of changed some of their daily routines? Are they not eating as much? I guess you could say as well, because sometimes um, people use um, nicotine as a as, as a dietary supplement of sorts, where they're not eating as much. So a couple of factors come into play when um, recognizing uh, nicotine and vaping use. But um, that old telltale sign of they smell real bad, it almost like they smell like a bar, or they've been at a bowling alley back in the day. Um, that kind of got, has gone away due to. Um, they just uh, dissipating into thin air and they're not causing that, that smell, that um, smoky smell in the air and clothes. But uh, I used to always take a look at um, did their clothing items change as well. Sometimes you'd see a kid that would leave wearing a set of clothing and they'd come home later in the night where it's something completely different because um, the smell that may be associated with the marijuana use um, or even uh, traditional tobacco use too. And Kevin, is it okay for a parent to check a room, their car, backpacks? I'll tell you what, my rules are my house, and that is uh, my, my children's rooms are, um, they belong to me. Um, I do like to respect their privacy, but uh, you know, if they're bringing stuff into my home, if they're bringing stuff into my house, it's fair game for me to search. And uh, you know, even if my, uh, my children have their friends over, their friends need to understand that they're entering my house, and if they're bringing illegal substances into my home, uh, I reserve the right to go through their stuff if they're in my own house. So. Uh, now, my kids are not um, uh, that old. I'm a, a middle schooler, but uh, my children understand my job and, and, the, and the works that I do. So they actually can educate their friends on some of the substance use uh, things that I've shared with my kids. But I would, if that's what you're setting me up for. Yes, you can search their car, you can search their room, you can search their backpacks. Um, you are still the parent here. Uh, we're not trying to be the cool parent, we're trying to be a responsible parent. And uh, by enabling the problem, we're just making things worse for them. So certainly, you don't want your child's substance use to escalate to a level that um, you know, there's no turning back. And I know that we uh, heard some, some conversations about the law and, and what happens in the, the prefrontal cortex and brain and, and impulsivity and bad decision making. It's all true. And substance use certainly in fact impacts um, how you uh, make those decisions. Right, so black heart, um, it, it, it's interesting, but I, I don't know all the pricing on the jewel device I'm going to but what's interesting even looking at, um, I'm going to use marijuana as an example because that's an easy one for me to do. If you look at back in the day when Colorado legalized marijuana for recreational use, a gram of marijuana was about, you know, $30 or so. 
And because of the saturation of the market and the accessibility of black market stuff, a gram of marijuana now in Colorado is probably about five bucks. And so the prices continue to drop. You look at the concentrates in marijuana, with like the dabs, the, the waxes, the butters, the shatters, all these concentrates, they were about 50 bucks when they first came out for a gram of that stuff. Now you're down to about $20. And so the same thing applies to e-cigarettes and vaping is what once was a $30 item, now you can buy it for 10 bucks. And, but like what you heard, we're seeing this influx of crime being committed and kids robbing kids and kids robbing, kids robbing dealers uh, over what, 20 bucks of material? And so it's getting scary with regards to the amount of crime that's going on associated with these products. Just real quick, I would just say one of the things as a parent to look out for is a lot of these kids are going to have these vaping devices, they're going to have them in their pockets. So when you're doing the laundry, um, I know I do my kids as laundry still. I'm the 14 year old, and you know, I used to say, Oh, you can do it. I'm tired of doing yours. Now I want to know what's in the pockets. I want to go through the pockets. So I, I have gone, I have reversed. But if a kiddo has a backpack, um, this has happened at the junior high level a lot where the kiddo keeps it in their backpack and they don't want mom and dad to open that backpack. So if your kiddo has a backpack and is adamant that they don't want you to get into that backpack, get into that backpack. If your kiddo has a binder that they're adamant that, you know, it's just a schoolwork that's in there, open up their binder. Because I guarantee you there's something in there that they don't want you to see. A lot of times when the, these jewels first came out, parents were seeing them and just thought it was a USB, it was a, a jump drive for a, a computer. They didn't realize what they were seeing. Once parents saw and they realized that that's not what that was, I mean, we still have parents, you know, who maybe their oldest one right now is only fourth or fifth grade. And so if you want, we need to be educating our parents, our friends, and saying, hey, this is what they look like. A lot of parents were seeing just the pods. So they weren't seeing the actual device because the actual device was on their kid. You know, the empty pod is what they were finding around and they didn't know what that was. I don't know how many last year when we did these presentations, how many parents in the audience said, oh, well, that's what that was. You know, had seen it, didn't realize what it was. So I would just say, keep, keep an eye out if there's something they don't want you to do. If they don't want you to go in their room, go in their room. And I did bring some with me. Um, so I do have devices up here. You can see the pods, you can see the jewels, and just kind of a quick visual. And I think you've got a question now. I'm going to tell you a little, little bit of information. Uh, 20 years ago, the average age of first use in the state of Kansas was 17 years old, and that's nicotine alcohol. Um, 2019, the average age of first use in the state of Kansas is 12, almost into 13. So um, you heard me say that I went to the middle schools yesterday at Pioneer Trail Middle School. Um, our target population is actually now middle school kids because that's where they're starting uh, more frequently than we were one time we were in the high schools. So now middle school is the target population. I'm just curious if there is secondhand smoke risk like there is with cigarettes. That's where research is more, uh, needing more research. What happens with these devices is because there are, you saw the list of different chemicals involved, when they're emitted, they are a fine particle, they are emitted into the air, that's kind of that vapor mentality. So a lot more research still needs to go into what is that secondhand exposure. Uh, my 12-year-old daughter, she has um, asthma. She can pick up if someone's vaping around her because she starts coughing. So the fact that she's coughing tells me that there's got to be something that's being emitted in the air that does impact uh, the lungs. Uh, there's been some research done in a controlled environment, a small environment. They said that there um, is an impact on paint on walls and varnishes on furniture. And so if it's influence, if it's uh, infiltrating the, the paint and the varnishes and there may be some um, entering into your lungs, which is a very, like I said, vascular system. So uh, much more research needs to go into the potential secondhand vaping effects. Hi, since the nicotine levels are so high, so fast, like, do you have any tips for kids who are addicted to nicotine to get them to stop? So here's the difficult piece about this, I'm, and I'm so happy that um, Mr. Brady here is talking about um, Aspire and looking to preventive measures for, for all students. When you get down to it, it turns into a money issue. There's not a um, diagnostic code or a billing code for smoking cessation. So there's not a lot, there's not that I'm even aware of. There's no smoking cessation programs. Um, that you'd actually take your son or daughter to um, for smoking.
smoking cessation. So uh, really what it comes down to is being more educated on um, the harmful effects and having those open conversations with them. So uh, if we were smart, we'd start developing some smoking cessation programs for kids, oh, I guess for anybody, um, to assist them with, uh, with their addiction to smoking and cigarettes. Uh, there are, um, you know, there's the Can Quit program, you can call in and you have like a, a spot, someone who works with you, a coach. Uh, there are FDA approved um, lozenges and gums and, and different devices used to help you with, or maybe even with a patch, um, to provide lower levels of nicotine, kind of eventually lead you off. So um, that's probably the first route we need to be taking is, um, whether it's the Inspire program, but also getting them into the, the Can Quit program, which is a uh, Kansas organization. Um, you mentioned that the consequence was five days out of school suspension. What happens with repeat offenders? What happens with repeat offenders? Yeah, do they just take these fire over again and they run the game system? I mean, it's obvious a problem. Yeah, good question. The question is about repeat offenders, what happens? We, we do have repeat offenders, but not, not a ton, uh, which, which is a good sign. Typically what we do, we, we upgrade the consequence, and we also look at are there other issues going on besides vaping, uh, you know, bedroom, other drug issues, alcohol issues that are taking place at school, other than other uh, discipline issues, and you combine some of those together, a kid could go to an expulsion hearing. Uh, that would be the end result. And if we go to a hearing, they could be out for the rest of the semester. The law allows us actually to go a full school year. 100 school days. That's a very rare situation, but, but it could happen. Are the parents involved in this, actively involved? Yes, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I should mention this earlier. One of the things that we do to help families, if uh, they get busted for uh, the tobacco, alcohol, uh, or drugs, we provide at no cost, in, in probably 95% of the cases, a drug assessment with an outside professional. We pay for this through a, a, a grant, and I call it tobacco fund grant that, that we get, and uh, which is a great service. So then the student goes to Kevin, for example. Kevin's done dozens and dozens of these for the Oasis School District and some other school districts. And they go through a comprehensive assessment. It's not a your analysis, but uh, yeah, I can yeah, you know, describe that. The big, the big thing is then parents get information about how serious is this for my kid. Is this just a one-time deal, or is my kid a big-time user? Just real quick on the consequences. Typically, the reason you don't have repeat offenders is they probably graduate to a more serious crime. So if the first time is vape, the next time it's maybe alcohol and or marijuana. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you will have the consequences the school provides. We work with the SROs. When our office files charges, um, we would put them on some form of court supervision where we let the SRO and the school know conditions of their probation, which will include some loss of liberty, not that they're locked up, but they might have curfews, they will have probation officers, they'll have community service, they'll have to, under court order, follow through with drug and alcohol treatment, whatever the assessment says. So I think the reason you don't see multiple vaping offenses is they probably move on and get caught doing something maybe a little more serious, so the next time they get not only a school consequence, they might get a court consequence, and it kind of starts stair-stepping up. As the crime gets a little more serious, the consequence gets more serious, and eventually can lead to complete loss of liberty um, in terms of being locked up, but that takes a pretty serious crime. So um, I think that's kind of the hierarchy we see, it just kind of move from one to the other. I'm all like Kevin explain what that assessment is all about. And I'm glad that Tim brought this up because I wasn't going to, but it's um, the assessment that I complete. So at any time that youth is suspended from school, um, they do have an option for different facilities that they can go to. I'm one of those facilities. That, um, I actually do the assessment myself. And uh, last year, I want to say we did about 80, um, only, close to 80 only the school district kids that okay, did an assessment. I think I'm up to about 14 or 15 right now. I did one today, I did one on Friday last week, Thursday or Friday. I've got one tomorrow, and I've got one scheduled for at the end of the week as well. So anytime that these kids get uh, suspended from school, I'm doing a six dimension assessment on them, which is what I do when I'm doing an assessment on a youth that I know needs to come into my facility that has a more pronounced 
uh, substance use history. I do provide the kid the option that they can sit in the division with me and then we bring mom and dad back in. However, in most cases, um, I do kind of convince them to have mom and dad sitting there present with me and I just ask them to be as honest as they humanly possibly can. And we start diving in a little bit further into their substance use history and I'm asking anything about uh, whether they've licked it, tasted it, rubbed their elbow in it, I don't care what they've done, I want to know what they've been up to. And we start to really dive into some of that alcohol use, and some of that early uh, cannabis use. And I start providing recommendations. Now, the way the schools, yes, they're paying for it. Their main concern right now is that they're getting the kids some help. And uh, when I report um, to Tim, so I emailed you today, didn't I? Yeah. So even today, uh, I use the initial of the youth, and I tell them from what school. So I'm not using their name online and just saying, here are the initials, here's the school. They arrive for their assessment. And um, if I'm making recommendations for that youth and for that family um, to continue with outpatient services, or maybe in some cases even my program, my residential program, um, I work with them on getting them set up for those services and kind of identify some approved, um, some of them are approved court providers. So if I know that they are in diversion or probation, um, I will identify an approved court provider that they can go to for outpatient help. But the one thing, and some people will say, why are you wasting too much time on vaping? I've caught so many kids with more underlying mental health issues that when I'm discussing with them why are they using, why are they vaping, and they've kind of got their arms wrapped up, and I start asking them about their arms, and I start seeing the cut marks on their arms or, the, um, or on their legs, we're starting to identify many more mental health conditions. And to me, that's that I'm doing my job if I can catch a kid that needs more support not only in their community, but um, in their home and providing them with um, individual family education and, and therapy as well. So um, I just always kudos to Boy the school district for the efforts that they're making to get your students help because if we can just brush underneath the rug and the student's gonna go away, uh, we're not doing them any service. So. <coughs> While I get back here, uh, how do I start a conversation with my kid about this? I, I've listened to all of this and it sounds really great, but what do I do now? How do I talk to them? To me, that's the most important question of the night. How do you have that conversation with your child? And please share this with others. And I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'm, I'm a parent of three. I've been in education for 38 years, 33 as a school administrator. And I've seen a lot of things come and go, but I will tell you, baby, is probably the biggest epidemic that I've seen in my, in my career. Our high school administrators deal with this every single day. There's a book out called Crucial Conversations. What I like to do is call it Courageous Conversations. Because as a parent, you have to have some courage to have that conversation with your child. You just gotta do it. And you have to ask open-ended questions. I'm big on time, place, and manner. When you have those three things in place, that conversation is going to go well. But just ask them some opening questions like, hey, what do you know about baby in your school? Do you have friends that are involved with that? Let them know that whatever their answer is going to be, that you're not going to judge them or give them consequences, or you're not going to report it to other moms and dads and all that. Make, make sure there's some trust in that conversation and stand by your word. And then as you have that, get deep in that conversation, ask them. Hey, there's no, I'm a, you're not going to be in trouble here, but have you vaped? Have you been smoking cigarettes? Tell me about marijuana use. Just, just ask those questions. And as a parent, you know what your kid's like, typically, right? You, 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 their neck starts to get red, you start to sweat, you look to the side. You, you know. And then just start having that conversation and just say, hey, I'm here to love you. I'm here to support you. What can I do? But you've got to start the conversation. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. And, and you say, well, should I have my spouse uh, involved in that conversation too? You can, but then it kind of gets looks outnumbered, two against one. So I, I, my opinion, I've got some other folks, counselors and stuff here that might give you a different answer, that maybe one-on-one -on -one is probably the more safe situation. Do it on their turf, in their room. Talk about place. That's probably a good place to do it. Uh, I've heard parents say, I just do it in the car sometimes. We're just riding, we're going someplace, just do it in the car. That way we have to look at each other, eyeball to eyeball. The bottom line is just do it. That's good advice. So um, depending on the age of your child, so something I've done with uh, my wife is actually her idea. Uh, my daughter's 12 now, and we do what's called 10-minute Tuesdays. 
And so it was just kind of a set time, and my daughter can choose if she wants to talk with me or if she wants to talk with my wife. But 10 Minute Tuesdays allows her for 10 minutes to ask us questions. And we talk a little about being a safe environment to ask those questions. And but we do reserve the right to call time out. And my wife and I will spend some time talking about um, what the joint message together would be on this. Uh, but it has really opened up the line of communication with our daughter that she feels that this is a safe place to come to. I can ask my parents stuff. But then we have a rule that says the information and the, the advice that we give to you does not give you permission to go tell your friends that this is the answer or this is what you have to do. They need to have those conversations with their parents. So we encourage her to tell her friends, you should probably ask your mom and dad about that. So um, it's a taste of place of time. We do it in her um, bedroom on her bed. And she gets to say, I want to just talk with dad tonight. I want to talk with mom tonight. And then we have to distract the, the boy somehow. But, um, and so I think it's open lines of communication and really having those difficult conversations at the same time. <coughs> Uh, since the uh, trend nationwide is for decriminalization of a lot of marijuana products and the nicotine ones are legal anyway for adults, does uh, the Johnson County uh, Sheriff's Department or Lake the PD have any programs to work on locations perhaps where um, maybe older kids or black teens or young adults are buying or younger kids uh, sting operations, uh, enforcement activities? Or maybe when they catch a kid uh, with them, backtrack and see if they can find out who bought it for them, if it's an older sibling or relative, neighbor, kids in school that are older than them, for enforcement activities to kind of try to cut off the source, if it's pretty difficult, if it's just kid to kid. Right, that, 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 that's a good question. Uh, furnishing intoxicants or furnishing, in, in other words, social hosting is a big is a big thing on the alcohol side, and we try to take a real strong stand on that. It's a little bit easier for law enforcement to figure out because they just go by a house when mom and dad are gone, and there's 30 cars outside. Kids are not super smart about that. So we, the law enforcement is able to bust a lot of those. In terms of the older sibling going and buying, if we are made aware of it, we will definitely prosecute that because that is a crime. That's not just a, a ticket offense or a citation. Um, but you would be surprised how rarely these kids will give up the person uh, that, whether it's something fairly minor in the criminal sense, like their jewel pod, who gave, got them their jewel, or their beer, all the way up to who did you buy your 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 marijuana or this you know, LSD is back a little bit or PCP or things we're seeing like that. Who did you get that from? Um, they won't tell us that. I, I, I conduct formal diversion conferences with kids who are trying to get, uh, avoid a conviction on their record and adjudication. And, and we'll ask them to say, hey, you, you need to tell me who, who gave you these drugs. And they'll just say, I'm done. I'll, I'll take my consequence. I won't give you that information. So you would think it would be logical and easy to backtrack through it, but a lot of these kids will not tell us that. So when we are aware of it, we definitely try to amp up the consequence for the supplier versus just the user. The user, we're more of a help level, uh, certainly the first time, maybe the first couple times. Um, and then the supplier, we try to put more of a consequence on and also get them help because they're normally users too. Um, but it's, it is not law enforcement. To tell you, it's, you would be surprised the number of times they will not give up that information. Uh, I think for you and I, who are kind of law-abiding, that's just a logical thing. Why wouldn't you say they won't? Um, and that's been my experience anyway. But we, when we can, we do. Just not as easy as, as it seems. And I know from the school resource officer position, because lots of teachers will come to me, because they overhear kids in the classroom talking about whose house they're getting it from and what they're getting from. And I have always been very open with all of my teachers at the schools that I've worked at. And I've always let them know that if they have information, just kick me an email. And um, what I do with that information is I just pass that on. The Lake Police Department does have a narcotics unit. We do make our own cases. So what I will do is I will pass on that information. 
if I know a specific person who possibly is dealing out of their vehicle, I will pass on that information to our drug unit. Not passing, I don't pass on teacher's names or anything like that, but the information, I just say, hey, it's been brought to my attention that this, you know, this person who lives at this address and drives this vehicle is known to do these things. They're, you know, bragging about it. Make your own case. Obviously, our drug department is really good about what they do, and they will go and they do undercover buys all the time. Um, I can't tell you how many because I don't know because it's their they're their own little unit. They, you know what I mean. It's and it's best that it stays that way. But they make their own cases. So what I would say as a parent, um, I, we had a parent email um, and our administrator that said, hey, you know, pictures off of Snapchat of a, you know, a student doing illegal things. Pass that information on to your schools. Pass that information on to your school resource officers. Um, I, I take that information and I just pass it right along. And I know that it goes to good hands. Um, also, going back to having those conversations with your kiddos, I, as a parent, thought I had a pretty good, you know, relationship with my kiddos. But our kiddos are doing lots of things on their phones that we don't know about. And the reason we don't know about them is because we look at their phones that it, that's their personal property. So my 14-year-old only got her phone when she graduated from eighth grade. That was the, that's the requirement in my house. You don't get a cell phone until you are graduated from eighth grade. So we got that cell phone and the requirement to keep that cell phone is that at any given time, you have to turn that cell phone over to mom or dad. And I get to go through that cell phone. I get to look through all of your pictures. I get to look through your Instagram accounts. My kiddos don't get Snapchat on theirs. Um, if they I find Snapchat on their phone, it's automatically taken away. But it is this the first time was a difficult, yeah, she didn't want me to get have that phone. Now she knows I say I you know it's it's time and we go through. Um, I came across the issues that she was having that I didn't know about going through social media. Then we can have that, that conversation. So then we sat down and had these conversations about I didn't know this was going on. What can you tell me about this? And it was a hard conversation to start, but we had grown a lot closer knowing that, hey, there were things, there were mental health issues that we didn't know about, just things you don't know because your kids aren't always going to tell you. But we have that communication now, and it's a given. You know, um, kids have apps on their phones where it's a secret app where you can hide pictures from your parents, and it looks like a calculator. You know, and so there's just different things that I would say, as a parent, that phone belongs to you. You know, go through that history, go through that search history. You know, what are they looking at? Who are they talking to? You know, who are their friends on Snapchat or Instagram? You know, she has to friend me on Instagram so that I can see all of her things. If she opens up a second Instagram account, guess what? I know about it. I have, you know, otherwise it automatically gets taken. So let's say I had that critical conversation and I found out that, oh my goodness, my kid is vaping. What can I do? There, it's not, school isn't involved at this point. What can I do? Who can I go to? Well, I think uh, as you're hearing, it's usually not just an isolated event. That usually there's something else going on, whether it's um, uh, sometimes anxiety or, uh, or depression. Uh, I think if, if you're having a kid that's using um, vape devices, and, and maybe it, uh, Kind of heard it also kind of a stepping stone into other devices or other substances. Uh, I would start to be concerned that if they are now vaping, uh, what is the, the risk of alcohol use? Because, um, nicotine is number one and number two is alcohol. And so alcohol usually is that second easy, easily acceptable item, as you heard uh, Don talk about, and I'm victim of it too. In my garage, um, as we're, I have beer and, and some margaritas, and they get. Uh, and if kids are car hopping or they're garage hopping, uh, I'm giving them easy access to this stuff. So I think if I, if I was running across a situation where my kid was um, vaping, I'd start uh, looking up for uh, what are the services they needed, um, both in mental health and um, maybe even some community supports. But then also talking with my kid's family or my kid's friends' families. Because I can tell my son that he can't be on YouTube or playing Fortnite at my house. 
then the second he goes over to his buddy's house, he has access to video games. So having conversations with um, your children's friends' parents, saying, hey, um, I've got some suspicion that my, my son may be vaping, and um, I just want you to know that's not allowed, we don't permit it, so um, if your son's doing it as well, uh, I want you to be aware that we don't permit that, we don't allow it. And in most cases, they'll say, hey, us too, uh, thanks for letting me know, I'll keep an eye out for it too. So, um, I wish there was more services out there right now for nicotine cessation and vaping and stuff, but there's just really not out there. Sure, I know we're about done. Can I make a real quick announcement? Just uh, as some folks know, we, uh, I think sometimes uh, as educators, we don't do a very good job of tapping uh, the biggest resource that we have, and that's our students. So we are going to have a student vape summit at our Board of Education office. We'll be asking uh, 10 high school students from all five high schools, 50 kids. And we're going to be bringing some folks in and talk to them. But actually, the big thing we're going to do is we're just going to listen. What can we do better as a district to educate uh, our students and uh, about the ills of vaping and e-cigs and all that? And so anyway, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be December 4th. And we're just going to tap into a, a great resource and, and learn from our students of what we can do better as a school district. So I want to thank all, all of you for attending. Um, and being interested in this very important topic. I want to thank our presenters for their time and their presentations. If you have additional questions, they will be up here. Also, if you have concerns or you think of something uh, in the future and you want to ask someone, feel free to contact your school counselor, your school nurse, your school administrator. They can assist you with this and with some answers. Also, our website, if you go to the parent tab and you click on health, uh, there is a whole tab devoted to resources on vaping that gives you information and some of the resources that are available nationally and at the state level through K KDHE and KSDE, uh, the health department and the educate department of education, for those that don't know all the acronyms. So just so that you're aware of those resources that are available to you. And at this time, I believe we'll conclude our session. And thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Yeah, there are some devices up here. We want to come to the